Good evening and a very warm welcome to the London School of Economics and, and Political Science for this public event on growth through investment, what should the UK's FDI foreign direct investment strategy look like? I'm Susanna Morato, I am Vice President and Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at LSE and I'm also a Professor of Environmental Economics. I'm really pleased to be here this evening to welcome our speakers, Lord Harrington, Laura Citroen, uh, Professor Nigel Driffitt and Professor Ricardo Crescenzi. And of course our audience um, both here in the Hong Kong theatre and our online audience. Let me say a few words about our speakers and about the event uh, this evening. Uh, Lord Harrington was elected as Conservative MP for Watford in May 2010 and he was Minister of State jointly in the Department for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities and the Home Office. In 2023, he led a review of the UK government's approach to attracting foreign direct investment, co-sponsored by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Secretary of State for Business and Trade. The Harrington Review of Foreign Direct Investment offers a set of evidence-based and achievable recommendations for the UK to provide a tailored, responsive and comprehensive offer that meets foreign investors' expectations and factors in the speed of the modern world. Today, Lord Harrington will discuss the key messages from the review with special reference to implementation challenges and the current geopolitical landscape. We will then hear from our panel who will discuss how the Harrington Review's recommendations can be put into practice and what impacts they will have, both from an academic and a policy perspective. The panel will also discuss how best practices from around the world should inform new strategies to link FDI, global value chains, and sustainable and inclusive development in the, in the UK and beyond. In our panel this evening, we have Laura Citron. She's Chief Executive Officer of London and Partners, the International Promotional Agency for London. Prior to joining London and Partners, Laura was Managing Director of the Government and Public Sector Practice at WPP, the world's largest marketing and communication services business. Laura has spent her career at the intersection of business, policy and communications. Laura will discuss FDI from the unique standpoint of London, one of the most attractive FDI hubs in the world. Nigel Driffitt is a um, professor of international business at War Warwick Business School and he's also Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Regional Engagement. As well as pursuing academic research, he also works with a number of stakeholders, both locally and nationally, on issues relating to inward investment and economic development. Nigel's expertise in international business and firm strategies can contribute to a discussion of the relationship between FDI, location strategies and firm productivity. Ricardo Crescenzi is a professor of economic geography here at LSE, and his most recent book, Harnessing Global Value Chains for Regional Development, explores how regions, cities, and clusters can build, embed, and reshape FDI and global value chains for local enhancement. Ricardo will provide insights into the geographical distribution of FDI and its impact on regional development. Finally, let me just add how delighted I am to have this particular talk and debate here at LSE. The relationship between FDI, sustainability, and development is complex. FDI can drive economic growth and support sustainability goals, but its impact on inclusion and equitable development is less straightforward. The LSE's focus on these themes, which is, are central to our strategy, provides a valuable framework for examining how FDI can be structured to support not just economic objectives, but also to promote democratic engagement and ensure that economic benefits are equitably shared. Universities such as LSE are at the forefront of the UK's efforts to cultivate an open, innovative economy that is attractive to foreign direct investment. The Harrington Review underscores the UK's scientific and research base as one of the strongest in the world and a major asset in the pursuit of investment, highlighting that the country has four of the world's top ten universities. The LSE, with its global reputation in research and education, exemplifies how academic institutions are integral to the UK's strategic approach to attracting FDI, enhancing the nation's appeal as a destination for investment in innovation and development. Now, for those ex-users formerly known as Twitter, uh, the hashtag for today's event is a hashtag LSE harnessing GVCs. The event is being recorded and hopefully will be made available as a podcast. 
And as usual, there will be a chance for you to ask questions after uh, the, uh, the, the panel uh, finishes the interventions. For those joining online, please type short questions in the Q&A box and we will try to answer as many as possible. And please include your name and affiliation as well. But for now, I am delighted to hand over to Lord Harrington. Well, um, Susanna, thank you very much for that. Uh, problem with being a bit tall, you always have to move the microphone a bit. Can everybody hear me? Um, well, thank you for the kind introduction, um, Susanna, much appreciated. Um, I was asked, um, by way of background, you very kindly did some bits of my biography. The reason I was asked to do this review, I think, was that I was partly responsible for the, for the um, authorship of the industrial strategy in, 19, uh, in, in 2016, when I was business minister at Bayes. Um, the industrial strategy was a model, I felt, and Greg Clark, who should have the majority credit for it, was a model for a partnership between the private sector and government um, for what we hope was the long-term future. It was accepted uh, obviously by the government, um, it was a government document, and by the opposition, um, which was all very well until Boris Johnson decided that he was going to abolish it, because he didn't agree with it, um, which I thought was very sad. Um, my own political career ended in a crash when I resigned from the government over Brexit and had the whip removed from me at the time. Uh, so you might think it very strange that I was actually brought back to do this. But times change. In fact, it was Boris that brought me back to uh, come up with a program for the settlement of Ukrainian refugees here, which is completely irrelevant to tonight. But um, I was actually brought back to the government to do that. And I thought that I had finished in government again um, when I was called by Jeremy Hunt about, in fact, I think it was a year ago this week. Um, he asked me to pop over to see him. Um, and he explained that he was concerned that we'd been losing some significant foreign direct investment deals to other countries. And um, he wanted me to chair a review reporting to him and to the Secretary of State for, uh, it's called the Department for Business and Trade now, to look deeply into the reasons why. To avoid the knee jerk, which I would be very happy to do and say, oh, it's because of Brexit. Or if you're of another political um, type of person, you'd say, oh, it's because corporation tax is too high. So we were asked to conduct a review to look really beneath the surface. What, and I was given a good team of civil servants to do this, by the way. I, I say me, but it, it was a team of people from several government departments. And we took evidence from about 200 companies, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, organizations like Laura's, uh, regional, national, trade bodies, in fact, anyone that would speak to us with experience. The upshot of which this review was published at the autumn statement um, in uh, the autumn, in, towards the end of last year, and was accepted by the government and I had made sure the Labour opposition had been involved in this from the beginning as well, so it was publicly accepted by them. Because the last thing you want, well, any time, but particularly in an election year, is for one lot to say, oh, yes, we're going to do it, and the other lot to say, we're not. Complete waste of time. And this should be non-political. This is how we organise the country to increase the amount of foreign direct investment that we get. So was there a problem? Well, if you look at the, and in my, the review, which is online on gov.uk, you'll see the top line surface is not really too bad. Um, it doesn't plummet too heavily after 2016. Um, it doesn't go up, but it, it does not look like a complete disaster. But if you strip away two elements of it, one being renewables, which are all very well and good and has been successful government policy, but actually it's heavily subsidized by the government to bring technology and hardware that's often manufactured abroad. If you strip that away and you strip away non-greenfield investments, that is what I call share swaps. So shares in a company are owned by British institutions or family or founders um, and American private equity or any other form of private equity purchases it. It's technically a part of foreign direct investment 
but in terms of, whilst that might be very good to grow a company and bring future new investment, it actually can distort the numbers. But the overall trend since 2016, if you strip out those two things, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's not a disaster, but other countries are beginning to overtake us. So it was really interesting to look into why. The cause celebra deal, I think what triggered the investigation was that we lost AstraZeneca to um, Ireland in this particular case. Well, again, it's easy to say, oh, Ireland's got 10% corporation tax, that's why they went there. In fact, that's completely irrelevant because AstraZeneca won't pay any corporation tax because it's largely research and development based. Um, that cliche was not a correct one. Um, but the team there, the, um, UK, the authorities at AstraZeneca gave us our map, gave my team, their management team, actually for two or three days to really delve into their journey, into what happened and why, which was very good of them to do that, um, very useful. And it was that kind of evidence in that detail that we got uh, from many companies. And by the way, many had said, oh, yes, we've invested here and we would invest again. Please don't, I don't want to give the impression that this is a total wipeout and a total disaster, but we're all trying to evolve with the world, how the world is really trying to, is changing, and, and what we're going to do about it. So what did we find, really? Well, there were two um, kind of sections of evidence, um, one of which was a broadly political thing, which was basically the lack of consistency in policy. And I could give you 20 examples or 30 examples, all within one political party's regime, the Conservatives, not changing um, completely, in fact, at all, other than within the party. And I could, uh, you know, the ma a big macro example is I could just, when, when we wrote the industrial strategy, for example, we, on automotive, we came up with um, 2050 as the time when car companies would not be able to produce and sell new internal combustion engines. That didn't come out because of a whim. It came out because of a lot of evidence from big car companies, economists, scientists, modelers, you name it. They all uh, had input into it. And it was largely accepted that there was enough time for the investment cycle and everything else. I'm not asking you to consider the merits of that. I'm just saying that's the conclusion that we reached. Four years later, in 2020, Boris Johnson and Grant Shapps at a conference basically stood up and said, we're changing it to 2030. Well, from an, just forget which is the right policy or the wrong policy, but everyone's entitled to their views on it, but from an investment point of view, what are you supposed to think? It takes a lot of time to adjust. And then in, I think it was September of last year, the current Prime Minister said 2035. Again, you can agree or disagree with the policy, but from an investment point of view, that lack of consistency. And quite a few CEOs said to me something along the lines of, look, we obviously would prefer a good policy, we prefer we listen to. If not a bad policy, just keep it and we'll find ways to deal with it. And I know that sounds basic, but it was a theme running through so many of so much of the evidence that we took in areas from financial services through to automotive through to, I mean, it, literally it was a generic thing. And I don't quite understand why, given that other countries, if you take Spain, for example, there's a lot of political turmoil. I mean, no one quite knows who's going to be the prime minister at any one time because of coalitions and elections, yet the policies towards business seem fairly consistent. You know, we've got Ireland where it's generally felt that uh, Sinn Féin will take over the government quite soon, uh, whether they will or not, I don't know, but certainly it's a general feeling. But again, no one is suggesting to the Irish Development Agency that there'll be a change of policy towards um, investment or investment-related issues. So the policy matter is kind of the first tranche, and I think it's because governments come out with policies without thinking of the investment implications of it. I mean, there may be perfectly good reasons for it, but there is no one at the centre of government that's thinking, what is the investment, domestic and foreign, I mean, it's all the same, it's investment, it's new investment, um, what are the implications of it? So that's, if you like, the kind of broad policy matter. But then, the second tranche was 
in a way, I could sum it up by saying that the evidence showed, this is not a very professional way of describing it, but the evidence showed that we just mess companies about and institutions. You know, the, the times we'd heard we go from one department to the other. We don't know if we're going to get the money. AstraZeneca, for example, in 14 months, and they wanted quite a small amount of money compared to the total investment, no one could say, yes, you've got it, or no, you haven't. The money's there, but it's all over the place. It's in pots, challenges, grants, pushed to arm's length institutions like the UK Infrastructure Bank, British Business Bank, etc. There's no clear, defining way of saying, if you want some money from us for skills or research, whatever it might be, you know, basically fill out the forms, if you like, as complicated as they might be, ask for whatever due diligence you want, and within X days, it's yes or no. And this is a real barrier to investment. So, and I take some responsibility for this. When I was uh, involved with the industrial strategy, we set up uh, a series of challenges. So, for example, the Faraday battery challenge has won a lot of acclaim all over the world, but it's not a way for a business to decide whether they're going to get money or not. It's judged, at least it was when we set it up, once a year, which is great for a school prize day, but if you want to invest in something, you want to know if you're going to get it or you're not going to get it within a reasonable period of time. So that's the money piece, and then we come on to all of the other things which are obstacles. We have planning. You know, most countries are able to come up with possible sites for the type of investment that's wanted around clusters, where we have, of course, our conflict between the local authority or the planning authority and national interest for investment and other things. Very hard for an outsider to weave their way around that. We've got connections to the grid. Time after time, the evidence was that our system of deciding who gets priority to connect to the grid does not facilitate investment because it's a kind of cab rank system. And if somebody applies for planning permission for four houses in their garden and they apply now, a company a year later that can create 500 jobs, they come a year behind in the priority for connection to the grid. Skills. There's no one at the Department for Education who do an excellent job on skills who has to think of the employment or investment consequences of decisions to locate skills. Visas. Brought up many times. I went to the permanent secretary of the Home Office, where I used to work, so I know them well, and I said, could we have a system whereby if a company is signed off as investing, I mean, it's not for me to say what the trigger is, but should we say 100 million or whatever it is, that if they apply for visas, within 14 days, using the normal system of application, they can be told yes or no. Oh, yes, we can do that. Well, why don't you? Well, nobody's ever asked us, because there's no one at the Home Office whose responsibility it is to consider the investment implications, because government is so siloed. I know it's a cliche, but it is. You know, take, for example, the health department. We've got very good civil servants whose job it is to squeeze the big pharma companies to get the lowest possible drug prices for the NHS. Every country does that, by the way, because the government's usually the biggest um, customer for, for pharmaceutical, for, for drugs. But there is no one in the whole health department who has to think, actually, what's the investment implications? Because if you're Pfizer or any of them, you're going to think of the country where you're going to invest money. And if you can't make money out of supplying a product, you're not really going to be favoured towards that because there's no overall view. So we came across a lot of those kind of barriers. So for a big company, you know, if you're Toyota or Boeing or whoever, yes, you can employ ex-civil servants and people. They can wait, weave their way around the different departments. They get invited to round tables. They sort of weave their way around it all. But for most investors, it's, it's all too difficult. They, what they want is, in the modern world is to basically express an interest to a government, get, tell exactly what their requirements are, and receive a package within so many days, as long as it's stipulated when, um, for everything to do with that investment. Now, it's not always money. 
It really isn't. In many cases, it wasn't money. It was other matters. But it's just too complicated a system. And um, I just, I won't go on about, on about it anymore, but the review's online, and there's a lot of evidence in it that we've used. Um, that's why it took so long. It was collecting all the evidence rather than, because I could have come up with the recommendations at the beginning. So I know you said 20 minutes, Susanna, so I'm going to just go through briefly what the recommendations are, and then perhaps we could um, talk in, in, the, in the panel discussion. So the whole recommendations are designed to bring investment to the centre of government. Because at the moment, it's dealt with by basically a government department, Department for Business and Trade, which actually is the same ranking as any other government department. So if you're a junior minister at the Department for Business and Trade, you, you go to the Home Office about visas, but what do they care? You, you're just another government department. I'm not saying they're rude to you, but they say, look, our brief is this for visas. You do your stuff. So it's to have a cabinet, senior cabinet-level committee uh, called the, believe it or not, the Investment Committee, which sets out a business investment strategy to find where, what we need to go for and what we need to do to attract businesses in that. So if you speak to an Airbus or someone like that, if you say, what do you want from the government, often it's not just, oh, we need X million to build a new factory, it's can you help us get our suppliers to come to an area around us? So we have to find out who that would be, what we need to do to attract them with packages. So a senior level cabinet committee, a senior level minister of cabinet level who has some clout with number 10, and the Treasury, as well as the Business Department. Because people like the people that run these sovereign wealth funds, you know, a lot of them are in the Cabinet themselves. OK, they might be related to the ruler, but that's their system. That's nothing to do with us. You know, we have to deal... They want to deal with people they think have power. So it's moving all that to the centre and for every government department to have a minister and senior civil servant, part of whose responsibilities are to consider the investment consequences of their decisions and to be judged on that. So the kind of examples I've given for health or with visas won't happen, or at least if they do happen, they'd be a, it would be taken after considering the investment consequences of all of these decisions. So I think I'm nearly out of my time, Susanna, but just to say briefly on implementation, um, we reported basically towards the end of last year I'm meeting with the Chancellor's people next week to discuss implementation. I'm told the committee has already met and they are starting to appoint ministers and I'm pushing on it and I'm asking everybody that has regular, well, regular meetings with government, of which there are plenty, including your organisation, Laura, to keep mentioning it and keep pushing it. Because it's an election year and whilst it's not political, um, in so much of we agree with it, we don't. I mean, things get pushed aside and forgotten about and too much effort went into it. I don't want that to happen. So that, in brief summary, is what the whole thing's about, and I look forward to comments and questions later. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you very much, Lord Harrington, and thank you to the LSE for inviting me to be part of this important conversation today. I'm Laura Citroen, and I run London & Partners, which is the business and destination agency for London. So our mission is to create growth in the city that is sustainable and inclusive and resilient. We're a social enterprise, which means we're funded partly by grants, partly by the private sector. And an important thing to know before I go on is that we receive zero pounds from the Department of Business and Trade for our work on foreign direct investment. So I can say wholeheartedly, and not because they're paying me, that we really welcome the Harrington Review and support its recommendations. London & Partners runs foreign direct investment for London, as well as other work supporting the growth sectors, so trade and innovation. We're also the agency that supports small businesses in the foundational economy, capital investment, destinations, so tourists, visitors and events, and London's global brand. But what I thought would be helpful to do was to frame my response 
to the Harrington Review in terms of what FDI actually looks like in London. And I'm clearly here on a panel of illustrious academics, and I'm here as the practitioner to bring you some, some tales from the coalface of FDI. Because I think when we think about foreign direct investment, we often have a picture in our head of very large brownfield sites, hundreds of millions of pounds, and people going around with a heart. In practice in London, most FDI is not like that. We're a knowledge and creative economy, and we're services led. And that's true for much of the UK economy. And it's really important that we think about FDI within that paradigm and aren't dominated by a manufacturing view of what foreign direct investment is. So our FDI clients are mostly innovation driven and mostly in services. Our biggest inbound markets are India and the United States. These are high growth scale up companies. They are in things like software, fintech, creative tech, lots of green and clean tech. That's our fastest growing inbound sector for London is, is climate tech. They're typically still privately owned companies, often backed by venture capital, maybe private equity if they're a bit bigger. And these are young companies, with young, often with young founders. These are businesses that were founded in the last five to 10 years and are growing rapidly. And typically, when they come into London, it's their first move out of their domestic market or out of their region. So if they come here from Bangalore or from Silicon Valley or from Shenzhen, often it's the first time they've left their home market. If you're familiar with venture capital, the typical size, certainly from Europe, would be a Series A, from the US, a Series A or B, slightly bigger if they're from India or China. And to give you a sense of the, the sort of scale of FDI that comes into London, we win a, between 100 and 200 FDI clients in a typical year. We've done, my colleague Maria's here, about 150 so far this, year, this financial year, which is about half of all the tech FDI that comes into London. So we have a pretty strong view of what's happening in the market. 65% of our clients are what we call contestable which means that when we met them, they were thinking about maybe investing somewhere else, but in the end, they chose London. So we have to work hard to win them. The typical time from when we first meet a client as a lead to when they land, they've set up a legal entity, they've hired someone, is 566 days, which is about 18 months. And interestingly, that is up quite significantly on four years ago when it was more like a year. So the time frames are getting longer. And at any given time, we would be managing around 1,000 opportunities. So this is very much a large scale uh, play. And I think it's important to think about volume versus value because, the, again, the knowledge economy is quite different to other sectors. What do we do for them? So our main offer is to de-risk and accelerate their international expansion. So we help them from the very early stage, building a business case for London, understanding why they would choose London over somewhere else, making sure that they're positioning their product or their service in the right way in the market, connecting them with experts, whether it's lawyers, accountants, headhunters, who can help them operationally to get set up. Bank accounts are a nightmare, as Richard, you picked up in your review, so helping them get their bank accounts set up. Um, connecting them with local talent pools and the local ecosystem for their sector, helping them to access clients, which is the biggest driver, and access talent locally. So we do all this, and it's all free for them. They don't pay. How do we know that it's working? We have a rigorous evaluation methodology because it really matters to us that we know whether we're making a difference and how we're making a difference because that means we can direct resources. And we were delighted that your review um, recommended that our methodology be used uh, across government. So I won't bore you with the details, but, but very briefly, every single company we support, once they've landed, they have to fill in a form. 
where they say, I think I'm going to create this many jobs in year one and this many in year three. We adjust that for over-optimism. Entrepreneurs are incredibly optimistic. And we look back over the years and we know that what they say of year three jobs in practice, they do about half of that. So we knock half of the jobs off because we know they're just a bit, they're entrepreneurs and they're very excited. We then adjust for what we call displacement, which is, is this something really new and innovative? Or is this business going to directly compete and therefore just displace a domestic business? We then look at what the gross value added is for the jobs that they've created, which is based on average salaries in the sectors. We then do some uh, things which the economists in the room will find very interesting around social preference time discounting and things like that. And importantly, additionality. We ask them, how much of your decision to come here was because of us? And did we help you to invest more? And did you come quicker because of us? And all of that spits out a gross value added number. What's our strategy then? We're here to talk about FDI strategy. How do we think about strategy for London? We take a portfolio approach. If you like, we think a bit like a venture capital investor would think. We pick the growth verticals of the very specific subsectors where there's resilient global growth and where we think London has a competitive advantage. So it might be climate tech, it might be post-production for the film and television industry, it might be fintech or cyber. And then we aim to capture as much of that market share of those growth verticals as early as possible. Because what we want is for businesses to come to London early in their growth journey, because then they're more likely to put their regional or their global headquarters here rather than somewhere else. And just to give you some examples to bring that to life, and I'm going to go back to 2011, which is the year that we were, we were founded in our current form. We had a company that came to us from the US and said, we've got this cool tech platform where people are gonna rent out their spare rooms to each other. And we're like, okay. That was Airbnb. They created 22 jobs in year one and nobody had heard of them. We had another business that said, we've got this idea for this social media platform, but you can only write 120 characters. Same year, that was Twitter. They came in with 25 jobs. So my point is that of the 150 FDI companies will land in London this year, we couldn't tell you which of them is going to be a unicorn or a decacorn and a massive employer and shape our knowledge economy for the future. But by picking the right sectors and trying to capture as much of them as we can, we're trying to give ourselves the best chance of having some of them. And that's our approach. And it's very different from a place-led approach. And this is, why, this is what I will, I will end on, which is to really ask ourselves the question, do we need an FDI strategy or do we need FDI strategies? Because FDI strategy really depends on the context and what we're trying to achieve. An FDI strategy that's trying to increase productivity would look very different from a strategy that's about job creation. And that would look very different from a strategy that's about reducing regional inequalities or place-based regeneration. In London, we're really focused on creating high-quality jobs in innovation-driven sectors. And that's why we do it the way we do. But that means that our FDI and the way we do it operationally day to day is different. So in a place-led approach, you're talking about a small number of strategic high-value projects, like the AstraZeneca example that you mentioned, or Boeing or Airbus. We're looking at a large number of initially very small projects, or quite small. Place-led tends to be manufacturing or other place-specific. Sector-led tends to be for the knowledge and creative economies, but not always. And this is a spectrum, right? I'm setting this up as two paradigms, but there's obviously space in between. Place that is linked to specific projects, whereas the knowledge and creative economies tend to cluster, but perhaps a little bit more broadly. What do they want is different. So for the place-led, the space, the infrastructure, and the supply chain are really key, as well as sometimes proximity to universities. For the knowledge and creative economies, talent, customer base, and to some extent regulation, depending on the sectors. But it's about customers and talent primarily. And where do they need help? 
The first group need a lot of help with things like planning and infrastructure and connecting to the grid and supply chain. Our clients typically need help with winning customers, finding great talent and R&D. And the place led, we tend to be talking about big capex, like hundreds of millions of pounds, shovels, building things. Our clients tend to go first into a WeWork or another shared office, then they might take a floor, then they might take a building. If they get very big, they might build a building. But this is really about services sector occupiers of buildings, rather than people who are digging things and, and doing construction. And so I'll, I'll end there. Um, and I just thought it would be helpful to give that bit of context so that when we think about FDI, we really think about the whole spectrum of FDI that we need in the UK. Sometimes place-based is, is absolutely what we need, if that's the, the kind of economic policy objectives we're trying to fulfil. But sometimes we need to understand that FDI is about knowledge and creative businesses that are quite small, very agile, and extremely values-driven. Thank you. So I'm a professor of international business, which means I'm supposed to understand firm strategy. You said it all, really. I've got to think of something else to say now, because that was a really good description of how foreign investment wherever is really heterogeneous. And in, in some ways, one of my responses to the, the Harrington Review is actually to say it's, it's even slightly worse than you, than you suggested because of because of the heterogeneous nature of, of, of inward investment that happens anywhere. International business people tend to divide it into four, and I don't really like it, but basically it's either you're going somewhere for a market, you're going somewhere to access technology, you're going somewhere because it's cheap, or you're going somewhere because they're resources. And within the UK, let's leave the resources one out for a minute, but within the UK we see really different patterns in that across different regions of the UK. One of the, one of the things that, that I was struck by from Laura's talk is if you want to pick any sector, anything you want, and you want to draw a graph that shows the distribution of FD of inward investment across UK regions, you can't include London because it looks like everybody else is naught. The difference in scale is so much that literally you can't see anything on the graph other than a big line and lots of zeros. So I think in some ways Lond London's success is, is a challenge for the rest of the economy. Um, I appreciate I've come to London to say that. You might not be interested in that, but it presents a, it presents a challenge, and it presents a challenge really for, for two reasons. One, picking up on, on what Laura said, and I'll come back to this in a minute, the FDI that is coming into the UK is changing. And it's changing in a way that presents a number of challenges for policymakers. Okay, firstly, it's more focused for obvious reasons that let's not dig up again. It is more focused on supplying things to the UK. We tend to call it kind of market seeking in international business parlance. But basically, more foreign investment, not all, but more foreign investment that is coming into the UK is focused on selling stuff in the UK. Now, that can be all sorts of things from the professional service firms that, that Laura was talking about, and I know that a lot of London's professional service firms are very export intensive, so I'm, I'm not generalizing. But if you look at sort of manufacturing or, or the other things that create jobs in other parts of the economy, it's very focused on supplying to the UK. Now, in many areas, that presents a challenge. And you talk to anybody who does large-scale capital intensive in, in manufacturing, you cannot reach scale by just selling to the UK. It's just not, it's not big enough. You, know, you, need to be, you need to be exporting, and let's not discuss that again. Um, in, in other parts of the economy, in other parts of the country, one of my, my frustrations, and I think this does come out in, in Richard's report, but presents a challenge for the regions, is too often inward investment attraction 
is seen as a substitute for regional policy. So we've got a lagging region, so what we need to do is we need to attract some capital in, you know, to create some jobs. Now, the problem is that if you pick anywhere, I, I grew up in Liverpool in the 1980s. I know I don't sound like it now, but trust me, I did. Um, unemployment was not the problem. Unemployment was the symptom of a lack of investment and a lack of innovation and a lack of skills. Okay? Jobs, recessions are not caused by too many people losing their jobs. They're caused by not enough jobs being created. The only exceptions to that are 1929 and very briefly 1981. Okay? But we see, so we, we see job creation as the solution. Whereas actually what should be the solution is stimulating investment, stimulating innovation, stimulating skills. So I have nothing against inward investment that is designed to create jobs for people who currently don't have one. You know, whether that's Amazon warehouses, call centers, DHL hubs, UPS, I appreciate first um, sports director or a UK company, but they're creating jobs for people who don't have them, and I, there is a role for that, but that is not going to move the dial. It's not gonna move the dial on productivity in that region. And so we need to understand how FDI is changing and how the rest of the UK can essentially make Laura's job slightly harder by competing for it better. And I, and, and I think what that means, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go slightly off, off topic of what Ricardo asked me to talk about, if you don't mind, um, and basically make a plea for devolution in this space. And again, I've come to London to plea, to plea for devolution. But if we, want to, if we want foreign investment to make a better contribution to productivity, to innovation in the regions, then we need to, while we need to take account of what Richard said, we also need to think about that in a in a devolution context where what we're basically asking, picking up again from what Laura said, what we're asking foreign investment policymakers to do is align skills, innovation, technology, productivity and investment. Now I don't see how you can do that for Newcastle from London. I just, I just don't see it. I don't see how in 50 years We've, we've tried that, we've had Department for Education running skills, we've had all the things that, that Richard talked about. You also need a degree of devolution in this space to deliver on what Richard was talking about. The problem is, um, as has been demonstrated in Middlesbrough, devolution is messy. Um, devolution causes some of the problems that that you've outlined. You've got different people pulling in different directions. Um, if a company goes to America, they know they're going to talk to the state governor. They might be talking to other people as well, but that's the person. Come to the UK. Okay, come, I, I, live, I live in the West Midlands. We have a mayor. Half of my work at Warwick University, if you've been to Warwick University before, Half of my campus is in the West Midlands, governed by our mayor. The other half is in Warwickshire, which is not part of the combined authority, so we have Warwickshire County Council. Now imagine, you're there tomorrow, we're trying to sell that to an urban investor. Well, if you're this side of the road, you need to talk to them, and if you're that side of the road, you need to talk to them. They're even different planning authorities. Yeah? And then lots of parts of the world don't have metro. How am I doing for time? Um, fine. Lots of parts of this country don't have metro mayors, so who do they talk to? So, equally, what I would also do, and again this, this speaks to, to what Richard said and I think expands on what, what Laura said, is the other key thing that, that you need to align with whatever you're doing on foreign investment is you need to align it with business support. Um, this gets a bit boring and you're talking about SMEs and, and whatever, but so in my, in my past, I woke up one day and discovered I was dean of the business school. When you're dean of the, I, I kid you not, that's what happened, but that's another conversation. Um, uh, when you meet a small firm, 
and you're dean of a business school, the first question they are going to ask you is how can you help me get into the supply chain of, insert company of choice, Jaguar Land Rover, whoever it may be. Equally, because I've been studying foreign investment for a while, if somebody is circling the, the West Midlands, I generally get kind of brought in to help make the sort of case that, that Laura was talking about. And the standard question then that they will ask is, tell me about the potential for developing supply chains locally. So in other words, it's two sides of the same coin. Working with, with big firms and working with small firms is two sides of the same thing. And they need to be aligned. And again, I don't see how you can align that at anything other than a relatively local level. Um, Laura also really eloquently talked about the importance of understanding labour markets in this context. So I, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago that was called something like Foreign Investment in Hot Labour Markets and demonstrated that, yes, you know, there is always space. So an example from not the UK, which I think sums this up. Um, the, outside Boston, as in Massachusetts, not Lincolnshire, there are a whole load of biotech labs. And it is really, really common for people to change jobs in the sandwich queue at lunchtime. Because there is, there's all these people doing biotech stuff, and there's a shortage of people. And if you've ever been to one of these places in America, the huge sandwich trucks pull up and people stand in a queue. And they get talking to the person in front of them in the queue who says, oh, we're looking for someone who does that. Oh, well, I've got a doctorate in that. Oh, right, well, can you start work? We'll pay you 30% more than you're earning now. They go back in, they resign, and they start work somewhere else. That is how hot those labour markets are. Cambridge is kind of getting a little bit that way. And if we're not careful, and I, I'm, I was interested in the, the London perspective on this, we run the risk of chasing the high-tech stuff, but into places it wants to go where there's already lots of high-tech stuff. And all then you're doing is, is overheating already he overheated labour markets. You know, basically, on average, wages have been flat since 2010. Yeah, that's fine. There are some sectors where, that have seen 10% year-on-year earning wage growth because we have such a shortage of people. So if we want to do, to finish, all the things that, that Lord Harrington eloquently said we need to do, we need to align that with a skills policy and with a labour market policy that gives foreign investors what it is they want. And at that point, I shall stop. I'm trying to like, keep the time because the watch over here is not working. Um, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants here, so I'm trying to add uh, something to what the other speakers have just said. But let me thank you, uh, Richard, Laura, and, and Nigel for being with us uh, tonight, and Susanna, our Vice President, for her support to this uh, area uh, of research and, and policy discussion. Um, I didn't resist the temptation to bring uh, a couple of slides, okay, with uh, two uh, key points that I think might help uh, uh, highlighting some points, some challenges uh, for the implementation of uh, the recommendations that come from the Harrington reports. Uh, if we can have the slides here. I need, okay, voila. So the, the first like, point is on the like changing landscape for global uh, foreign direct investment. Okay, we do see these are uh, the latest uh, OECD figures on, on foreign direct investment, and we see that like following COVID, the global landscape in terms of foreign direct investment has changed quite uh, significantly. And if we look at new uh, Greenfield FDI projects, we do see that uh, a recovery uh, has somewhat, uh, 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 has been challenged. And, and in particular, the announcement that is a little bit of a, a way to anticipate a future uh, investment decision has been, uh, uh, been blocked uh, by uh, inflation, increasing inter interest rates, and most important of all, a uh, changing uh, geopolitical landscape. Another important like, piece of evidence is that in this changing landscape, and we do see that we compare the pre-2008-2009 uh, world of foreign direct investment with what we see today, 
uh, there is an important uh, change. Uh, here we are looking at data for uh, the EU and the UK uh, combined together. And we look at, with the blue line at new foreign direct investments, so new FDI projects, greenfield projects, the one that the speakers before have been talking about as the one capable of generating employment opportunities. And here we are looking at the jobs created by these uh, investment decisions. In the BARTs, we are looking, however, at another important aspect of the process of internationalization of our economies that has to do with decision to expand the activities of foreign investors within their host economies and are the lines in green. So this is not about like new greenfield investment, that's about foreign investors expanding their activities, creating jobs in their host economies by hiring more people in their existing uh, subsidiaries, in their existing sites. On top of that, and, and we see that they account for like a very important uh, part of the internationalization story that becomes even more important in the current landscape where new investment projects are lagging behind and not expanding as expected or as they were doing before and even more so in the new geopolitical landscape. But very importantly, there is another aspect that very often is missing in our discussions about FDI and is the issue of divestment what happens about foreign investors that decide to fire, that decide to reduce their activities in the host economy. And we do see that this particular uh, spin of the process of internationalization or deinternationalization of our economies is growing in importance, in particular during COVID, following COVID. Okay? So it's an important like, part of the story, the issue of divestment that links with the function of uh, uh, public policies in terms of their capacity to retain existing investors, to convince existing investors to expand their activities, as well as to prevent divestment, becomes a very important part of the story when we think about FDI strategies. So that's like a first like, important point for reflection. The second uh, uh, point of, uh, for, for, for reflection that I would like to bring to the table that is touched upon uh, in, the, in the Arlington Review is the issue of uh, 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 the geography of uh, opportunities from green FDI. And here, like we look at new data, so I couldn't resist, uh, uh, and, and I know that uh, uh, Juan uh, Alvarez Villanova is working with me on this project, might be a bit scared about <laughs> what I'm showing. But here, this is a very preliminary like, view of a methodology that we have developed to look at green FDI. And look at green FDI going beyond their sectoral characteristics, so going beyond, beyond the carbon footprint of the sectors and looking at the type of activity that is pursued by foreign investors in the host economy. And this allows us to classify green activities going beyond the emphasis that is uh, in the Arlington uh, review on the energy in, in the energy sector. Okay, so here, like what we are trying to do is to look at beyond energy generation, what type of investment have a green uh, type of, of footprint. And here we can see that the geography of green FDI is uh, quite diversified at the subnational level. Okay, so there, and, and, and we can see when we look at like what is contestable, what is it that other countries can attract and can aim to attract. We can see that there are, uh, there are lots of places in Europe that are not the usual suspects, that are not the usual FDI hotspots, that are uh, important sites and potential uh, places where green FDI can land. And we can see that this has important uh, uh, implications when we look about also green FDI in R&D, so where the research in new green technologies uh, might be located looking at Europe and the UK. Uh, so this is true for R&D, this is also true for like production, the more traditional uh, uh, production focused type of investment. So we see here like we have a story of a changing landscape and, and that's where the, the implementation of the recommendations that Lord Harrington has discussed uh, has to deal with. A changing global geopolitical landscape, a changing FDI landscape where divestment and expansion might play a, a very important and new role, so going beyond the attraction of FDI and new opportunities, but also new challenges for a variety of places beyond the usual suspects, beyond the big uh, FDI hotspots uh, when it comes to supporting the green transition as well as the digital, the digital transition, the key uh, big objectives when we think about future growth and future employment opportunities. So having set like a little bit um, 
the framework, I would like to like, discuss uh, uh, three key points uh, on how FDI strategies might change or might evolve in response uh, to these challenges uh, and to this uh, evolving landscape. Uh, the first point is to try and take, when thinking about foreign direct investment, to try and uh, take a global value chain perspective. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, the topic uh, uh, of the book that we have recently published with Oliver Harman uh, here uh, with us today, is the idea of uh, looking at something that cuts across sectors. So we are not looking at attracting only investments in particular sectors, so going beyond the sectoral perspective to understand that products and services are producing complex chains of activities that go from the R&D, the design of the products, uh, uh, to uh, the, the necessity to look for the necessary inputs to the actual manufacturing, then the distribution, and then the marketing, the sales, and now we know that beyond after sales we have an important uh, uh, issue with the recycling, for example, of the afterlife of our products. This is what forms a chain, and this chain span multiple countries, multiple regions, multiple continents. So, and, and foreign direct investment is just one way in which multinational firms orchestrate and control global value chains across the globe. So when we think about what type of investment we want to attract, how to deal with foreign investors, we need to think about the wider picture, the broader picture. Uh, ask ourselves, okay, what type of value chain is being uh, linked with this particular investment? And when we think about FDI in a global value chain perspective, we intrinsically link FDI with trade because foreign direct investment orchestrate trade flows. Uh, multinational firms with their subsidiaries might be producing something in a particular country and then shipping what they have produced in other countries, generating trade flows in intermediate goods, in intermediate components. So it's very important to link you know, our understanding of FDI not only in terms of final products, but also in terms of intermediate goods, of these parts of components, and then form the final product. Think about our iPhones and all the components uh, that, that uh, form uh, the, the, the final, the final fo uh, phone, and where are they produced, and shipped from, and shipped to. So if we take a global value chain perspective in understanding FDI, we immediately link FDI with trade, trade not only in final goods, but also in intermediate goods, but we also link uh, inward FDI with another important part of the story that is outward FDI. And outward FDI becomes something that might need to be promoted and supported because through outward FDI we might link our regions, our countries, our cities to global value chains in a way that can generate jobs and innovation and employment opportunities at home. So the, the if a focus on uh, uh, global value chains uh, expands our perspective and makes our strategies richer and more full encompassing. Um, of course, like when we think about FDI in a global value chain perspective, uh, we immediately see how uh, a strategy for FDI is a strategy that goes beyond uh, one single strategy, but uh, as Nigel was suggesting, becomes a set of strategies that deal with an architecture and the governance uh, for FDI attraction. So that's a, a, a structure and an architecture and governance for internationalization that links the process of internationalization that involves inward and outward FDI, trade in final goods, trade in intermediates, with a, a, the overarching objective of delivering sustainable development in an equitable manner uh, across space and across different types of stakeholders. So multiple layers, coordination across multiple policy areas, as uh, Lord Arrington has suggested, uh, even beyond uh, uh, the areas highlighted in the report, uh, uh, the importance of going beyond businesses to include education more widely, the provision uh, of, of skills, the support of universities to research centers, as well more generally uh, dealing with human capital and its mobility, for example, the role of uh, visas, uh, not only uh, for businesses, but also, for example, for international students has important implications for FDI flows. And finally, uh, the role of local governments. Like I said, like a multiple, a multi-layered uh, like architecture, and it's very important that local uh, governments, the localities have, have a place. It was what Nigel uh, suggested before, to, uh, but going beyond uh, um, the, the, the devolution of powers, but the, uh, um, discussing and reflecting on a devolution of competencies and how important it is for places to develop their own uh, individual and unique uh, value proposition, avoiding uh, dynamics of territorial, uh, of territorial competition that are, in the end, zero-sum or negative 
negative sum games, uh, leveraging uh, local expertise, but also uh, reclaiming a role for uh, local governments in international negotiations. Like we said, uh, these strategies have to do with trade, have to do with trade deals, have to do with the projection of countries and regions in the international arena. And, and let me conclude by saying that it is not only about uh, um, uh, uh, strategies for inward investment, for the attraction of FTI, like we said before, but the importance of organizations that are close to local businesses, that are able to understand global, but also local supply chains, becomes crucially important when we extend the remit of FDI strategies beyond FDI attraction to take into account strategies to mitigate, to mitigate the risk of divestment and facilitate the expansion of local business businesses in the host economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations and such insightful evidence and, uh, presented today. I will now open the floor to questions. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and wait for the steward to come. I will ask questions in groups of three and also from the online audience. Please keep the questions short and please state your name and affiliation when you ask the question. I'll start here at the front, the gentleman at the front. Thank you all for, um, for really interesting um, presentations. My name's Tom Arnold and I used to work, I used to study at the LSE and I work in government relations. And my question is for Lord Harrington, just to expand on simplifying the process for um, foreign investors. Um, for example, in terms of perhaps changing the special advisor system within the government, because at the moment, I'd say probably Frank Pettigar in number 10 is perhaps the most valuable person to engage with for a foreign investor, perhaps more than Lord Johnson in business and trade. I was just wondering what you think about the special advisor, that role, especially if it's quite a political role in perhaps a depoliticized area. Thank you. Someone uh, uh, over there on that side, please. Yes, my name, is, my name is Stefano Bonfa. I'm from Oxford Sustainable Development. It's a group of independent research, let's say, Europe-wide. And the question is, uh, I very much appreciated, uh, let's say, Professor uh, Crescenzi on this type of green localization, digitalization. You don't think, the question is, you don't think that before you start, uh, let's say, any process of digitalization, green or even you need some kind of observatory to say an evidence based observatory what does it mean for you evidence we are in an area of digitalization this means we have a lot of possibility of data so this means how you can convince through the evidence the politician to change the direction and this is the question thank you thank you and one last question uh, gentlemen Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentations. Um, mine is actually generally to all of you. I'm Giacomo Gazzellone from Roma Madre University. Um, in, a scenario, in a scenario where nationalism is uh, ever growing and we've got uh, two major elections in UK and the USA, uh, what would the speakers think of um, the immediate future of FDIs? And, how can the political uh, sphere interfere in uh, the evidence that we have presented today? Thank you. Thank you. So who wants to answer the first? Yeah. That's right. Well, um, I can have a stab, um, Susanna, two of them. The, the simplified process one. Um, you mentioned two individuals who are an example. So we have Frank Pettigas, who is uh, the Prime Minister's business advisor, which is a short-term appointment last um, as long as the Prime Minister lasts or until they get fed up and want to make more money again. Um, and we've got Dominic Johnson, who you mentioned, who is a junior minister in the House of Lords. Now, this, what I'm about to say does not reflect either of them as individuals because they're both very fine individuals. Dominic's one of my closest friends and Frank was a great supporter of my review. It's not personal, but the problem is it's not, I'm talking about a structure. So when Boris Johnson was... Um, Prime Minister, um, Jerry Grimston, a big city figure, he'd been a civil servant, was, the, was Frank Pettiger, if you like. He was his business advisor. Because Boris and, and, and Jerry were like that, and could, Jerry could call him every five or ten minutes, 
stuff happened for business. Then Jerry leaves. Frank doesn't know what he's talking about at the beginning because he's a banker from Morgan Stanley. Poor old Dominic's a junior minister in, in, in trade. Well, if you're a big foreign investor, you want to speak to someone that's got the ear of the boss. So this is not a reflection on Dominic or any other individual. My recommendation is to set up structures which override whether there happens to be a particular individual or another in it. I know that sounds bureaucratic, but structures are the things that matter. Otherwise, you just get one person who happens to be quite good and has a bit of clout, and the next person doesn't. So that's that question. I'm afraid, the, I'm afraid so I did not understand your question. I hope, um, I hope our professor here, or either of them, can do better than me at that. But on the nationalism and election point, uh, which is a very valid one, um, I do worry about it, first of all, because elections are instability and investors look for stability. So even for whatever happens at the end of those elections, it's going to be an investment problem. But secondly, from a political uh, philosophy point of view, there is a strand in America and there's a certain strand of the Conservative Party in the UK who really thinks that if the tax is right and government keeps out of business, that everything's going to be great. Um, you know, really, it's all this minimum state stuff and that government should get away. That is very dangerous. And I say, and I've said it to the Prime Minister and anyone who cares to ask, we are not market makers in this country, we are market takers. That's because we're a smaller country. Therefore, in a business, you have to do what your competitors do. And whether you like it or not, whether you've got a moral view, a political view, or the money or not the money, just like in a private business, you have to do what your competitors do. So decisions like, should government get involved in incenting investment inwards to them, is not really a choice from your political views. It is actually a reality of what your competitors do. Does anyone want to add anything to any of the points made? The last question, if I may. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I just I couldn't do not know enough. On the question of, of, um, of the politics, for the founders that we work with of high growth scaling companies, values matter enormously. This is a generation of mission and purpose driven entrepreneurs. We are dealing with the founders of companies who are making their own choices. These aren't boards that are responsible to invisible shareholders. These are people who've built their companies through their own blood, sweat and tears. And so they make very personal decisions about where they want to expand and invest. It's not like dealing with a big multinational where you'll have a huge business case of thousands of pages and you compare lots of data points. Founders in the, in, of the type that we deal with choose to come to London often because they feel it's a place where they'll be welcome which shares their values, often around, for example, the environment and social inclusion and social justice, liberal, typically liberal and progressive values, very loosely defined. Um, and it's a place where they can have a good life and their family can have a good life. And that matters enormously and we don't talk about it enough. And we always put values at the front and centre of our investment proposition because it really matters to those founders, but also because, let's be honest, we cannot compete with the likes of Dubai and Singapore on incentives. They are throwing money at these tech companies. And we see it very directly because we run the, the program that takes London-based high-growth companies to expand internationally. So at any given time, 10 to 15% of all the scale-ups in London are on our program. And we see what, for example, Dubai is giving them in terms of financial incentives. And we will never compete with that. So we have to compete on, on where we can win, and where we can win is on values. And so for us, that, that will always be front and centre of our investment proposition as London. Do you want to go first? Um, yeah. So I'd like to like, um, give three, three, three answers. The first, like link with the issue of uh, structures. Uh, I think when we think about structures for like FDI attraction, we really need to make sure that these structures are then empowered. So there is the issue of 
like power and resources to the structures. Um, we have studied, we looked at the investment promotion architecture and, 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 and the structures across uh, all uh, European countries and we have a huge diversity of arrangements as the, 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 the review highlights. And the most successful ones uh, you can have different models that are compatible with different institutional settings of different countries, but really the successful structures are the ones that are able to come up with a clear strategy and offer a clear sense of direction. So there is the issue of creating the structures, but the creation of structures per se runs the risk to increase what we call transaction costs, the, the difficulties of, of, of dealing uh, with, with, with governments, the, 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 the cost of running businesses. It's very important to create structures, but make sure that these structures are empowered and are given resources uh, to make things happen on the ground. Um, on the question of digital and green and, and the importance of, of evidence, uh, I think uh, this, is, this is very important. Um, Digital and green are big uh, uh, keywords at the moment in, uh, in, in research and it is an, 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 and in the public policy discourse and the public policy narrative. And that's where it is very important to take an evidence-based approach to make sure that we don't uh, follow um, uh, ideas that might, are not supported by data, are not supported by clear insights on, on how to shape public policies. So absolutely, I mean, and, and it is a little bit the commitment of the LSE to produce, like, sound evidence and, and uh, events like these are an attempt to bring some of this evidence in the radar uh, of decision makers and, and, and the general public. But I, I, I sympathize absolutely with this idea of the need of, of build evidence to support the decisions of the structures. Also uh, um, evidence that is able to understand change uh, and, 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 and give uh, timely inputs uh, to um, decision makers. Um, this links with the issue of, of the importance of geopolitics when thinking about the future uh, of, of foreign direct investment. And I think uh, uh, that's why it's very important to have on some key, key issues, on some key parts of FDI strategies and of the FDI architecture, a clear uh, cross-party consensus. Uh, when we think about, like, when the European Union is considering uh, new member states to join the Union, there are the famous Copenhagen criteria, and one of the criteria is having a cross-party consensus uh, among certain key ideas that make um, a country suitable to be invested by the EU and vice versa. I, I think what we need is something along these lines, to, uh, to make sure that there is, like, a cross-party consensus uh, in terms of what are the key priorities, what are the key values, what is the value proposition uh, in terms of uh, uh, FDI attraction and, and retention. That's the only way to navigate uh, a rather uh, um, turbulent moment uh, in terms of uh, forthcoming elections in the UK as well as in the US and these two uh, um, uh, big political uh, uh, moments uh, interact with each other creating a lot of uncertainty for investors. So that's where like the cross-party consensus that I feel uh, the the, the review has tried to uh, achieve on some key uh, points uh, is particularly important for a credible yeah. strategy. Okay, I think I'm going to move on to some other questions. Uh, Isabel, do you want to uh, get some, a couple of online now? And then I'll come back to them. We have a question from Baktawa Hare, a sixth form student from Newcastle. They ask, how does the government intend to align its proactive investment strategies as outlined in response to Lord Harrington's recommendations, with specific regional development goals and challenges to ensure a targeted and impactful approach. Um, well, shout to that one. Yeah. Well, the, the whole regional part of it is is really extremely difficult. And um, Nigel, you said a lot about this in your presentation. So the reality is, if I with a blank sheet of paper, I would do exactly the kind of regionalization and devolution that Nigel spoke about so eloquently. Because his Newcastle point, which you mentioned, and our, the question is from Newcastle, is, is a very valid one. The problem we have in this country, we've got a completely fragmented system of organization of local and national government. Um, I spoke at an event last week, and a German guy who's done very well, he's a sophisticated investor in London, he has this place at weekends in Somerset and wanted to attract some German companies he knew to invest down in Somerset, because it's quite a poor area, and he felt he was doing it not just to make money, but for, a, for the social purposes. <coughs> and he said, 
and he's an Anglophile German, and he's lived here for 20 years. He said, well, how is it? He said, in Germany, you know, every region, every federal region has an investment uh, authority, and I would put them in touch with them. He said, in Somerset, I've got the district council, the county council, the local MP, one town's got a mayor. He said, who do I send them to? And I could not answer the question. So, one of the great achievements, I think, of the coalition, I'm, I'm, as you know, I've not been making political points, but I think the whole thing about Metro mayors and the combined authorities is a really good one, because as Nigel has said, despite his problem with the line going through Warwick, where there is one entity, it doesn't matter what, what political party they're of, people like dealing with that one, it's not really, a, it is called a person, but actually it's an office and an entity, but more than half the country doesn't do that. And the rest is patchy. So if you take, for example, district councils, which cover a lot of areas, some of them, like, say, Stevenage in Hertfordshire, has come through really well. They've organised themselves, but most of them are subscale and can't. So it's not, just it's not just saying, here's a map, we're going to divide it up. We've got to have democratic and elected authorities that recommend a sustainable enough size to have its own investment um, authority. I'd say that's a long answer, but I think it's a really important question. Nigel, do you want to add something? Uh, I'll, I'll. Um, I've kind of got a... I had a six-point answer, but I'll just stick to the first one. <laughs> so, in summary, I would have a metro mayor for everywhere, and I would give them the agency to deliver, I'd have the Office for Investment, which is in number 10, as the front door, linked to the, all the, the things that Lord Harrison said, and I'd have the Department for Business and Trade doing the analysis. That's basically what I'd do in one sentence. I can keep going, but I won't. Yeah, I sort of got two if that's okay. Um, the first one is what I'm hearing about tax and 25%, and it sounds like you're happy to keep it like that. But if we want to attract uh, technical, uh, high-tech investment companies and people to come to this country, rather than going to places like Dubai or Ireland, uh, they're looking at making high profit, uh, high sums of money, and would pay high tax, obviously, at 25%. It's really big. It's off-putting for them to come here. It's typical ones like AI, surely. So for them, though, if tax was like 12% as it is in Ireland or something like that, 15%, then the, the, the bit of going to somewhere like Dubai and that rather than London, well, they'd probably be quite happy to pay something like low tax like that to come to London. And do remember, although there's no tax as such, you do pay money still in Dubai. It's not completely free. So that's my sort of comment, because we're um, not encouraging these high-tech, high-profit-making, high-tax-paying companies here. Now, the, the other one was on, like, Brexit and leaving the EU in kind of like uh, the reason why the government was like it was in... Um, slow to react and not dynamic, wasn't that, as I've heard lots of people say, a consequence of being within the EU? And that now that we're out of the EU, that it gives greater flexibility to the UK government to be more dynamic and more faster acting and make decisions that these investors need rather than taking a long time as to, like, which country they're going to be forced to go to by EU regulation and having to discuss things with multiple countries and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take two more uh, questions. Thank you so much for being here. My question is, science have a strategic or methodologic view. So what is, in very, very summary, the, the first steps to create a strategy, like very simple. Because I understand, for example, for the firm, that you use the uh, G, very high calculation, like methodology, yeah? What is the first step? 
how we can create the strategy to generate growth. Remember to uh, say who you are, where you come from. Um, my name is Ethan Richards. I'm a strategic communications consultant at Paul Vaughan Advisors. Uh, my question is on that issue of consistency in government policy um, in order, as a factor for inward FDI. What is your assessment of the UK's Labour Party's U-turn on the 28 billion on green investment? And do you think it will affect the UK's ability to crowd in investment in emerging green technologies? Thank you. No. I was going to answer on the tax point. So. Okay, you answer. Um, I'm not going to say that tax doesn't matter, because of course it does. But in our experience, working with high-tech companies, that's not why they come to London, and tax isn't why we lose them either. And that's partly because if you're a high-growth company, what matters more than anything is how fast you can grow your top line. And that depends on where the market is and where the talent is. And that's why they come to London. But it's also because where they have technically put their headquarters and where they're paying the tax is not the same as where they create the jobs. So what we see, for example, with a lot of the American tech is that, yes, technically, they might have put their operation running through Dublin, and that's where the tax is being paid. They will have 10 times as many employees in really high-quality, high-paying jobs in London. So I think there's a danger that we, are on a, we engage in a race to the bottom on tax in the expectation that that creates growth. It doesn't, it just drives people to move their corporate headquarters on paper. That's very easy to do and it's not growth driving. Um, if I could, I endorse what you said, Lauren. I, I, I won't repeat it, other than the fact that the evidence we received, tax was not the main issue. I think had it, if it was sort of 50% plays 20, 10%, it probably would have been. But if I could try and answer your Brexit point, I don't buy that. I mean, I believe me, I don't think Brexit is a successful thing. I, we are where we are, etc. You can pick your cliches out of the cliche bag. But the truth is, other countries in Europe, are, within the constraints of, of uh, being within the European Union, are much better at, at us than foreign direct investment. France being a classic example. Bureaucracy, rules, call it what you like, they've got their act together for foreign direct investment. So, so I, don't, I don't think, I'd like to agree with you, but I don't think. That, that, that's a valid point. Perhaps I could just have a quick one at the Labour point that this gentleman made. Um, I, do, I think the 28 billion amount is irrelevant at all. I think the electorate are confused by it. Most people are confused by it. Um, the reality is what and how government's going, whoever's in government's going to raise money for the government bit of foreign direct investment to do it. And uh, if anyone has any intelligent views of setting up, we can't have a sovereign wealth fund in the classic way because we haven't got the money. But there is a lot of evidence that if government part invests in an entity, then private sectors will, private sector stuff will, will come in. So I actually think that's the more relevant thing. And for what it's worth, I think Labour have made exactly the right noises on that. But of course, in opposition, it's easy to say stuff. Let's see in a year's time. Or maybe not, who knows? <laughs> Can, yes, can, can I answer you. the question just yes. here? So, so the, the way I would put this is, as I said, foreign investment is very heterogeneous. But it is also a case, really, of it's what you see is what you get. Okay? So, if my objective is jobs in Darlington, then... Amazon warehouses, DHL hubs, UPS are a good thing. If my objective is to generate productivity growth, then those, those sorts of things will not generate productivity growth. So, so it's about understanding what your region, what, your lo what the location needs. Um, now, one of the challenges is how we use foreign investment to maximise the benefits in lagging locations. Uh, and it's, it's not trivial. I'm having this conversation at the moment with the Office for Investment <coughs> on, how, on, on how we might do this. And it's, it's not trivial. But the best I can say is you align skills policy, small business, so, small, support for small businesses, and inward investment strategies and labour market policies together in a location. 
You know, you say, for example, and I know this came up in the conversations I had with some of your team. What if we were to say to some potential investor, okay, I tell you what, we'll build an FE college next door. You know, if you need a load of people who can code in Python to do what, to do not, not necessarily mundane stuff, but not, you know, not sort of world leading stuff like that, you need a bunch of people who can do that. How about if we just get the local FE college to put on a load of stuff? that will enable you to do what you want. Yeah, so that's, so that's what I mean. And you can't do that at a national level. That has to be done at a local level. And that's, that's how I think about aligning firm strategy, which is what the firm wants from the location, with what the location can give, but then what the location can benefit from. That's, that's the best I've got. Keith Allen and uh, I'm a friend of LSC. But uh, Lord Harrington, you, you, met, you started this evening with your comments. And I can go back a little bit further than uh, where you started. But Thatcher first brought in the concept of public and private uh, working together. Uh, and that all started off quite well. But in more recent times, it seems to have been taken over almost entirely by private equity in our infrastructure. And they seem to have gutted it. And they're going to give it back to the local authorities and the government with no money to, to spend in it. So when we talk about inward investment, we do have to be careful that it's managed properly and for the right reasons. So 100%, let's encourage uh, foreign investment into the country, but let, let's make sure it's not at our expense. It is for our benefit as well. But if I can ask uh, Professor Nigel, uh, with regarding of pushing money away from London, etc., we're in a, a school of economics. There should be much more emphasis, I would believe, in investing in uh, universities in all different parts of the country where you can have satellite uh, industries built off innovation and technology and everything else. You would bring more foreign students, you bring more foreign investments into growth areas of innovation, external of London. Is, is that the sort of thing that you're thinking of? Okay, and one more question over here. Hi right there. Um, my name's Juan, I'm a PhD student here looking into uh, regional investment promotion. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point about um, what uh, the regional investment promotion strategy might look like going forward here, um, just to get a bit more detail on whether you think sort of what's been happening, say, in the combined authorities can be transferred onto sort of the other areas that don't yet have one, is, uh, or can we even learn something from, from the experience of London, which is obviously doing sort of great work. Um, so yeah, just wanting to get some more detail on sort of exactly what um, that might look like in terms of, is it another LEP mo LEP model, or is it sort of combined authority, et cetera? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, well, the... Um, gentleman's question about, I mean, I, I think what you said is correct about some of the things that were done with infrastructure, etc. Uh, basically, it's just an, a risk-free annuity that foreign investors have done, which anyone would do, but they have the cash to do it. But if I could counter your, your uh, very valid statement by saying I would quote other things. I'd quote in aerospace, for example, where according to an Oxford economic study, for one pound, for every one pound of public money, seven pounds of, it attracts seven pounds of private investment, a lot of it from abroad. So I think those partnerships, which I tried my best with the sector deals that we did with life sciences, automotive, aerospace and others, have shown a way that government in the modern world can partner. Uh, that's that point. And if I may briefly say on the regional side, uh, Suzanne, I, I mean, honestly, I think you, you know far more about this than I do, Nigel. The problem is, do we create a whole set of new entities again? We've been through let's, we've been through regional this, we've been through that, you know, or do we say, okay, let's try our best to devolve where we can. We know we've got some mayoral authorities, let's try and have a few others, but basically some areas can't do it. So, for example, I took some evidence from some towns around um, in eastern England that want to have a kind of, they want to attract agri-tech agri 
um, businesses to that agricultural area. None of those towns could possibly have a setup with enough money and resources to do um, uh, foreign investment. And I don't think we can just say we're going to take a map again, like we did in Germany after the Second World War. I mean, the reason they've got every, fed, every state's got an investment authority is we basically gave them a constitution that did it. We didn't, if we'd have given it to ourselves after the Second World War, we would be in a better position, but we're not. So I think we have to be pragmatic where there are areas, I quote Stevenage as a small council example, where they can be given some help to do it themselves. But I'm afraid I reluctantly have reached the conclusion that some things just have to be done through the centre. Any other final comments? So uh, I'm, I'm kind of not going to speculate here on the optimal number of universities in the country. <laughs> um, there are quite a few. Uh, speaking as someone who was on a, a ref panel, there are quite a lot. Um, that having been said, I think there is a greater role for universities in regional engagement and in regional development. Um, there are some really good examples. Um, one near me, we're back to LEPS, but when the, the Black Country LEP was created, the University of Wolverhampton said, we'll do that. OK, you don't have much, because LEPs weren't very well resourced. You don't have much of an intelligence function. We can, we can do an awful lot of that and partnered with the Black Country Consortium. So, so there, are some, there are some really good examples. They're not always kind of Russell Group ones. I think, as, as Lord Harrington said, the challenge is, what do you do in, um, what do you do in Barnsley? For example, you know, do you say to the University of Leeds or the University of Sheffield, that's on you, or the University of Huddersfield, that's on you, or do you find some way of incentivising that? You know, what's the what's the kind of what's the kind of model? But in general, universities plural are one of the best ways of levelling up that's ever been invented, because we basically take money from a limited number of relatively well well-resourced locations and we spread it around all over the country so i think there's there's two sides to that i think universities funding model could be looked at to incentivize such things and i think that that there is a role some universities are very good at being the university for their town or city as well as the university of it but i think we, there's always more um i i could do laps forever um I think I kind of slightly disagree. I'm not sure I'd necessarily go back to regional development agencies, but I, I think, I, I suppose I'm more of a devotee of devolution, and I think we need to find a way of making that work rather than saying, well, let's keep it in the centre. But I'd need a couple of hours to do that properly. Um, just to add like on, on, on this, without like reopening the conversation, is I, I think that's very important to move uh, into the idea of regional ecosystems and, and looking at something that goes beyond like the boundaries of the university or the boundary of the foreign investors. So it's really like the policy focus is at the linkages and what happens beyond the boundaries of these individual organizations. And that's where we have like regional policies, we have clusters policies, we have regional industrial policies. So that's where like we need to reflect and uh, to link with the question on, uh, on, on tax and the EU within the European Union, there was a framework, the EU regional policy, the largest like policy uh, uh, for regional development development in the world. So the issue is what is going to replace that. And this forms like a wider set of tools that link uh, uh, universities, foreign investors, domestic investors, small and medium enterprises into a regional ecosystem that needs to work for the investors as well as for the people on the ground. Th thank you so much. Um, so I will close the event now and I, I hope you feel like my, myself that we've been um, listening to some fantastic talks and some inspired interventions on this important topic of foreign direct investment. Thank you to the audience that came tonight to the Hong Kong Theatre and thank you to the our online audience. And most of all, thank you to our speakers, uh, to Lord Harrington, Laura, Nigel and uh, Ricardo. Thank you so much for taking the time. <laughs> for the